Great. So basically, I'm just going to start by doing just a little bit of some um, anatomy, basic science, sort of physiology sort of stuff, um, mostly just high yield kinds of things. Um, and basically, if you know the answer, great. If you don't, move on. And that's uh, no problem. Don't feel bad. And it's just all for learning for all of us. But mainly, I want to kind of get to the um, towards the end, I kind of want to get to some cases and just kind of um, shoot out some questions and learning about um, the cases, almost like oral board style. Um, so basically we'll start with PGY2s and, and then move on to PGY3s and then PGY4s. And, and if you know it, great. And if you don't, that's okay. So let's get started here. Okay, so Tyler, what is this little, um, what is this thing right here? And, uh, ciliary body. And how many of them are there roughly? Oh, 200, guess. Jordan, do you know how many there are? Um, I actually don't know either. Okay, that's okay. Don't worry. Can you shoot get shoot out a guess? Um, I'd say uh, right. about, about a hundred. Okay, let's move on. Abby, uh, one per eye, right? Ciliary body. H how many ciliary bodies are there? Processes. I, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I'm just like walking in. Th. Uh, one per eye, right? Because it, it's like a one thing. <laughs> ciliary body. Um, so there's there's multiple ciliary bodies. Um, right now we have anywhere from 200, 100. Um, let's see. Lydia, what do you think? I think it's to the pigmented and the non-pigmented part. But how many processes are there? Ciliary processes. I have no idea. Okay, Tony? Let's go with 50. Okay, all right. So there's actually, actually, uh, do any of the seniors know? Is that all? 80. Is 70 is what I thought. Okay, so it's usually about 70 to 80. Isn't there 80 or 70? Yeah, it's really about, it's really about 70 to 80. And 80 is really the number you should probably know. So about 20 per quadrant, okay? So um, oh, I'm gonna get to that question. So there's, there's parts to it. So what are the ciliary bodies? What is, what's significant about this to us? Well, what does it do? Actually, never mind. I just said that. So it's, it's on here. So, you so it secretes aqueous, right? So what part of it secretes aqueous? Let's go back to, um, let's go back to Jordan. Um, so it's the pars placata, so it's the non-pigmented inner epithelium. Okay, good. And, uh, and what's the rate that aqueous is formed? Let's um, go with... Uh, let's go with Brandon. So it's like two to two and a half microliters per minute. Okay, good. So knowing your anatomy of how big the anterior chamber is. Um, so Brandon, how much, uh, how many microliters makes up the anterior chamber? 250. Okay. Ish. So how long does it typically take for the anterior chamber to fill if say we totally emptied the anterior chamber? Yeah, so you just multiply it by 100 because it's 2.5 microliters per minute. So it'd take 100 minutes to make 250 microliters. Okay, good. So it takes about roughly about one to two hours to basically fill the anterior chamber if you completely dump it, right? So say you're doing a paracentesis and, uh, and, and basically for an acute angle, angle closure or any sort of glaucoma, you dump the anterior chamber completely and you drop it down to zero. 
Um, which by the way, a pressure of zero doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing in the anterior chamber. Um, a pressure of zero means the, I, I mean, a completely dumping the anterior chamber means the iris is flat up against the cornea. So it'll take roughly about two hours to fill up, right? And, uh, and typically that's what's happening when you're in, when you're on call. You dump the anterior chamber, you're waiting around an hour, two hours, it fills up again, right? Now there's some conditions where it can fill up a little faster. Um, but uh, that's when you're hoping that the drops will take effect and slow things down. Um, okay, next, let's see. Um, Lydia, this one's a little harder. Um, aqueous humor has more or less compared to blood plasma um, hydrogen. Well, I, why don't you go I in order to... for any of these, any of these four? Uh, I think it had, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just, yes, I know that I, yeah, I think it's, and you can reason, you can reason it out too a little bit. Yeah, I think there was one that it had more and then the others it had less, um, but I forgot what it was. I'm, I think it less, yeah, more That's, hydrogen uh, and then less of the others. Okay, um, so let's start with protein. So you think that it has less or more protein in the uh, in the aqueous? So I think the aqueous, since it's composed most, uh, mostly of water, I would say it's less protein. Okay, and bicarbonate? Less, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, no problem. Um, Tony? Sorry, so where are we at right now? Or which one? So we're asking if there, the aqueous humor has more or less compared to plasma. We have hydrogen. Cool, can I do all of them or just one? All four. Okay, so there's more hydrogen, more ascorbate, uh, less bicarb and less protein. Okay, is he right? Um, let's go with, I haven't, Marshall. Um, I, I thought it was like more bicarb and less of everything else. Okay. So by the way, just so you guys know, this is the most annoying part of all of OCAPs and also the most annoying part of um, uh, teaching glaucoma. So don't feel bad if you, you know, don't get any of these because it's just, this is just facts, right? Um, it's actually more hydrogen and more ascorbate and less bicarb, less protein. Um, and some of them make sense. I mean, you want less protein in the aqueous so that you can have like, a. I mean, you have a clear view, right? With less protein and when there's more of that in there, the things get more cloudy. Um, uh, so anyway, so those are just, one of those things that's probably going to be in your one of those OCAP questions. So more hydrogen, more ascorbate, less bicarb, less protein. Um, okay, so we're going back going back to the ciliary processes. So what procedure do we use to um, do we as glaucoma specialists use to kind of limit aqueous formation? Um, let's go with Tyler on that. So we can do cyclophotocoagulation, either uh, endoscopically or like inside the eye or outside the eye. Sure, and how does it work? So by burning multiple or one or multiple ciliary bodies, um, then you damage the non-pigmented epithelium, which produces the aqueous and therefore no longer produces aqueous. Okay. Um, and let's see, Abby, you may not know the answer to this, and this is not, 
it, this is just a surgeon dependent thing. Um, but how many quadrants do we typically treat when we're doing cyclophotocoagulation? I actually don't know, but I think two. Okay. So here at our, uh, here with most of our providers here, we typically try to do about 180 at a time. So we typically do uh, two quadrants worth. Um, oftentimes I'll start with the inferior 180. And then if I'm doing it again, then I'll do another 180. And we'll do, we'll often do it nasally. We'll do um, inferior and the superior aspect nasally the second time around. Uh, that's not true for every sort of provider, but uh, we kind of like to do kind of a light sort of treatment uh, in the initially. Um, this is not an OCAPS thing, but here we tend to like to start with um, sort of a lighter diode um, than most places would. And um, the reason why is because um, I find that actually has a lot of effect while limiting uh, quite a bit of the inflammation. Um, but uh, other places will be a lot more aggressive about it depending on the situation. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. There's something else that can happen on the uh, ciliary body this might be a, this is a PGY4 question, but there's something else that can happen on the ciliary body that can actually make them not function at all. Um, so there's a couple things, but um, let's see. So let's go with Mike Murray. So one that I know of is that if you get bad uveitis and the eye is super inflamed and the ciliary processes can kind of shut down. Okay. And do you know what's kind of happening in terms of, well, so there's, there's a way, well, there's a distinct way that they can actually shut down that's actually treatable. Do you know what that is? I guess the idea that I had is like treat the inflammation and they'll kind of, you know, start producing it, yeah, but I don't know exactly what you're going for. Okay. Um, Marshall, do you, do you know of a process that can occur on the ciliary bodies that can shut them down, but that's actually treatable? Yeah, the only thing I was thinking also was like inflammation. But I'll shut it down. I'm not. Do you know what inflammation can do specifically to the ciliary bodies? This is a kind of a top level question, so you may or may not know. No, I'm not thinking of anything. Okay, Catherine. No, I don't know. I was going to, I was going to joke in the beginning, SLTing the ciliary body, which I've done a bunch, but you know. Oh, by nope. accident. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Would it be oh. atropine that closes the junctions? So if you de-atropinize that you could open them? So, so actually, so since you bring that up, Lydia, by the way, this is how um, oral boards works. If you bring something up, they might ask you, but how does atropine work in the ciliary body? It closes the tight junctions and therefore would reduce uh, the outflow. Okay, so, and that's, that's a good answer. I think that the truth is we actually are not 100% sure exactly how that works, but that's, a, that's probably that may be very true. Um, there's something, a process that can occur actually on the uh, ciliary processes and so actually what I was getting at is a cyclitic membrane can actually form on the ciliary processes. That can occur due to inflammation um, independent of just ciliary body shutdown. Um, so that can actually cause the uh, eye to become hypotenuse. Um, and so that, uh, this is why you can actually ask Dr. Harry or do a B scan ultrasound to look for a cyclitic membrane on the ciliary processes, and it can actually be seen. And if they find it, then um, you can actually remove it, and the ciliary processes might actually start working better. So that's just that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Hey, Austin. This is Tyler. I just got a question. Um, 
I think of intraocular inflammation, uh, for example, AC flare as leakage of protein due to um, more permeable blood vessels. So I've always wondered if there's intraocular inflammation inside the eye and we have leakage of protein and other substances from the blood vessels, why does the pressure often go down? And is that because just the ciliary body shut down or, or I, I guess I just don't understand that mechanism. Why the pressure goes down in- With inflammation, if with you're inflammation. having leakage of um, protein and other substances from the blood vessels due to the inflammation. So if you're having leakage of protein, so actually, do any of the seniors want to take that one? The way that I've understood it is that the ciliary processes have to have a really active pump mechanism in order to actively get the fluid um, out. And so basically, when they get inflamed, then those cells aren't processing metabolically as well. So smart. Yeah, that's a better answer than yeah. I actually would have said. <laughs> basically, um, basically, the, I would have just said there's increased through the uveal scleral outflow. So, uh, okay, good. Okay, next, um, easy question. Uh, Tyler, what is this? Uh, the angle. Okay. And um, what was I going to say about it? Okay. So what's the angle composed of? I mean, some of these are kind of on here, but um, kind of describe this picture a little bit. Like, for instance, what is, what is this area here? Yeah, so that looks like, so I think, I guess, thinking about it inside the out, you have the trabecular meshwork, which is divided into, I believe it's uveal scleral, corneal scleral, and juxtacanalicular, followed next by the Schlem's canal, and then followed next by collector channels. Okay, good. Um, and then why don't we have Brandon kind of tell us the pathway of where the fluid flows? Or is Brandon on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, you're kind of you're kind of breaking up, but I think I heard um, pathway where the fluid flows, like starting from the auxiliary epithelium, or just like outside what Tyler said. Just the outflow. So you go through the. Um, corneal scleral uveal juxtacanalicular to Schlem's canal, and then to the collector channels, um, which I believe are like the aqueous venous streams. Um, and then I forgot. Hello? Actual aqueous is flowing out of, or to. Okay, like so you kind of broke up. So I'm gonna move on. Hello? So so Tony, after Schlem's canal, what, uh, where, and so he he mentioned collector channels, and where else does the uh, fluid pathway go after that? Uh, so, oh. Can I mute myself? Yes. yes. All right. So after Schlem's canal it goes to collector channels, then to aqueous veins, then. Scleral conge veins, uh, and then you go back into the anterior ciliary superior ophthalmic veins, and then cavernous sinus. Yeah, good. Um, so, what gives you a um, superior? What gives you a dilated superior ophthalmic vein sign? That's classic to watch out for. Uh, so that's when the flow is. Um, I think backed up and so the vein is dilated. Um, the thing that you watch for, I 
forget, but I wonder if there's like hemorrhage in the, um, or kind of some kind of trauma in the trabecular meshwork. Jordan, what does the superior ophthalmic vein go to, drain to? Um, does that, um, I'm actually not entirely sure what the first drainage point is. Okay, Abby, where is the superior ophthalmic vein drain to? It's kind of a big structure, well, in terms of the, the brain. Okay, that's okay. Sorry, Marshall, dilated ophthalmic, superior ophthalmic vein, what are you worried about? Um, so drains to the cavernous sinus, so I'd be worried about some kind of like dural cavernous fistula, maybe a CC fistula, um, yeah. yeah, something like that, thrombosis of some kind. Okay, good. So yes, superior ophthalmic vein drains to the cavernous, sin cavernous sinus. Um, anytime you have, um, you can have increased episcleral venous pressure from a lot of different diseases, but you see you hear the words dilated superior ophthalmic vein, you see that on imaging. Um, that's a boards kind of thing. First thing you think about is cavernous sinus, some sort of cavernous sinus um, syndrome or blockage. And one thing that you should definitely think about is a CC fistula. Um, and so if you get that on the boards, they'll show you that on boards. They'll show you a dilated superior ophthalmic vein. And one of the top differentials is a CC fistula. Um, so, uh, so what happens to this pathway during age, uh, as with age, with time, um, what happens to the actual trabecular meshwork? Does it get more or does it get less resistant? And we should kind of hurry this up because this is getting really, we want to get to the cases. So, um, Jordan, does it get more or less resistant with age? you have a 50-50 chance. More. Okay. And what about, who was that, Kathy? No. Okay, I was a senior that answered that. And then what about aqueous production with age? Does that get more or less? Tony. Less. less. Okay, yeah, so the TM gets more resistant with age and that's typically why glaucoma gets can get worse with age. Uh, but as you get really old, the aqueous production actually tends to decrease with age. And so um, patients sometimes in their 80s or 90s, all of a sudden their pressure will go down as, with time. Um, okay, uh, what types of procedures do we do in this area? So um, the minimally invasive glaucoma procedures are all in this area, right? Um, Marshall, give us a really quick overview of three or four types of things that we can do in the angle? Um, so you can do uh, like a trabecular bypass. So that'd be like um, eye stent or hydrus um, just to get you through the TM. Um, you can also do like a canaloplasty where you, you dilate um, the Schlem's canal as well as the, the like collector channels and things distal to it. Um, you could, you could uh, do like a, trabeculotomy or agoniotomy where you remove the uh, trabecular meshwork and part of the angle to uh, also bypass the trabecular meshwork or if you do um, like a filtering surgery like a um, that basically connects the AC to the subconjunctival space um, or there's some with a super choroidal space also. That's correct. We don't currently have any yeah. in the super choroidal space that used to be side pass for all of those who were familiar with that and that got removed from the market. Um, and everyone knows, yeah, you, anyway, you gave that lecture about that, but um, there are others that were working in that space, um, but currently none that have come to market yet. And I don't know that they will actually. Uh, okay, and just so you know, the canal is roughly about two to 300 microns in diameter. Um, okay. Classes of drugs. Um, Tony, what are the main classes of drugs to lower eye pressure? Yeah, beta blockers, alpha agonists, 
thrombotic anhydrase inhibitors. Uh, you have parasympathomimetics. Um, then I need help on some of the other ones here. Let me see. I think you got most of them. Um, oh, Jordan, how do... Okay. And then I think lastly, there's like epinephrine. Okay. Um, Jordan, do you know how these work typically? Um, so like the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors um, decrease aqueous production. Mm -hmm. um, I think the... So let's go one by one here. Let's go one by one. So carbonic and hydrous inhibitor decrease aqueous suppression. Good. What do beta blockers do? I think beta blockers also um, inhibit a little bit of aqueous production, right? Or is that all um, outflow? Okay, so that's good. No, that's correct. What do the alpha agonists do? Um, alpha agonists de decrease, or sorry, increase out, outflow. Okay, and what about the prostaglandins? I'm actually not entirely sure how the prostaglandins are working. Okay, Brandon? Prostaglandin, it increases uvoscleral outflow. Yeah, so at prostaglandins increase uvoscleral outflow, it's not that the alpha agonists actually both decrease um, aqueous production and uh, increase outflow as well but the other two are um, predominantly um, aqueous suppressants. Um, so how does pilocarpine work? Very simply, Tony. Pilocarpine works by um, contracting the, um, or basically pulling on the scleral spur and then opening the mesh work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the one class that you forgot about uh, that I didn't expect, it's not, I don't even know if it's in your OCAP or BCS book, is the row kinase inhibitors. Um, so let's see. I know Marshall knows the answer to this. Mer M Mike, do you know how the uh, row kinase inhibitors work? For glaucoma. So those, those are ones that actually work on the TM, correct? Yeah. Do you know the a little more details on kind of how they work in the TM? Uh, we don't exactly know, but I think that they relax uh, the mesh work, make it more compliant. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Actin myosin, right? It basically relaxes um, the, the TM there. So, um, okay, good. Uh, I don't know why I have some of these on there again. Doesn't it also actually don't? Uh, row kinase inhibitors also decrease uh, EVP. Yes, that is true. That is also a thought of how they work is uh, they will have direct um, effect on the uh, trabecular meshwork and they can also work downstream as well, uh, which is why um, as a separate, separate um, uh, therapy, it can actually work completely differently from any of the others when none of the others are working the row kinase inhibitors can all of a sudden work because it's actually even more of a downstream effect. And that's why you can actually get pressures below 10 with the row kinase inhibitors, right? Is because EVP is thought to be roughly around 10-ish. Um, and so that's why it's very difficult to get below 10 uh, with just the other drops. But row kinase inhibitors almost work in, in that sense, almost like a trab um, because it can almost bypass that or at least works downstream. Yeah, I was very convinced at the rep dinner, so. Oh yeah, that's right, you went to that too, yeah, okay. Did the reps talk about how well they were tolerated? <laughs> yes. They, uh, they talked a lot about that. Yeah, a lot of lies. Anyway, uh, all right, okay. Um, what's going on here, Jordan? Sorry, I'm dealing with something over at the VA that's crashing and burning. Um, okay. So you, you have gonio, um, and then you, it looks like you're doing um, a little bit of, um, is this like um, trabeculectomy, like kind of disrupting the trabecular meshwork a little bit? 
Yeah, well, we'll talk about what's going on. Well, actually, yeah, we'll talk about what's going on there, but um, I, I don't I don't know if you've seen any of these. So what's the difference between the view here on the top versus the view on the bottom? Oh, it's like, is it a direct view versus yeah, so, an indirect correct. view? So this is a direct surgical view, whereas the other one's an indirect, um, uh, in, in more of an indirect view, right? Uh, so um, in terms of OCAPs, um, they might ask you what type of lens that uh, they use for the direct versus the indirect. Um, oh, Ali. So I haven't called an Ali at all. So Ali, do you know the name? This is a little harder, but do you know the name of the types of lens that they might use for a direct versus an indirect? I think Kepi is direct. Uh-huh. And like a Zeiss or like the Formir would be indirect. Yeah, good job, excellent. And what principle is, um, does the indirect work, uh, uh, does gonioscopy kind of work on what, explain the sort of principle that's, uh, that allows us to see the angle where we can't normally see it? Oh no, I think it has something to do with like internal reflectance or something. <laughs> that's Optic. half correct, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, let's see, Lydia, what's, what's going on with internal, well, what's going on with what Ali said? Well, I'm, I was, I'm just wondering if it's uh, just the mirror that we're having the view by looking kind of by having the mirror angled so we can see the structure. But the big important thing with gonioscopy um, with the contact is that we can see if if there is any sneaky uh, or if there's any angle closure to see if this is appositional or not by just pressing on the angle and seeing if it opens. Um, AKA is there sneaky or is it just apposition? Uh, so that's all correct, but um, uh, there's a principle that this is working on. So Catherine, what am I going up for here? The tier air interface at 46 yeah. degrees. Okay. Good job, Brandon. Total, total. Sorry. Thanks, Brandon. I think. Yeah. So we're overcoming total internal reflection, right? So that normally the light is being reflected inwards um, at tier film, uh, air tier interface. And that's why we can't see it when we're looking in, but by putting on this, um, the, um, the lens directly contacted on, on the eye, um, we're overcoming that and that's how you're able to see the angle. Um, so overcoming total internal reflection, that's, that's key. Um, okay. I want to get to the case. This is getting super boring. Um, so Okay, so uh, we know what's going on. Here. Oh, well, actually, okay. So this is really important. Um, so what's the number I'm going for? What diameter of the cornea is being flattened? Uh, why don't we go with, um, let's go with Allie again. There's a number that's like really important. It's okay if you don't know. 3.3, 3.36. 3 okay. And is that correct, Abby? Um, yeah, I think so. I know. I remember three. I think it's three point zero six. Three point zero six. Good. It's three point zero six. So three point zero six millimeters is the answer. Um, for some reason, you got to know that number. Um, so that's the diameter of the cornea being flattened for uh, alpination tonometry, and this is based on the invert fit principle, um, where basically um, the cornea is flattened for a fixed diameter. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's, you gotta know that uh, for both boards and written boards and OCAPs. Um, okay. Uh, let's just skip all this stuff for now. This is really boring. All right, so, um, okay. Jordan, what is going on in this picture? Or what is this? Um, I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure. Okay, no problem. Uh, let's move on to um, Tyler. So it looks like pseudo exfoliative material that's deposited uh, a little bit on the pupillary margin as well as the interior lens capsule. I think this is, uh, there's like two different lines that you can have 
one starts with a Z, uh, like a Zent Myers line or something like that. Um, and the gene, uh, Fox L2, I don't know, I made that up. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's skip the gene for right now. What can oh. be associated, what's, what are the main things clinically to look out for with this? syndrome. Uh, okay. So you can have uh, zonular instability. So definitely wanted to know if somebody has pseudoexfoliation syndrome prior to cataract surgery. You can also have pseudoexfoliation or pseudoexglaucoma mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then this exfoliative material can deposit in other structures throughout the body. So making sure that they have the like, PCP follow-up to screen for any of that specifically the lungs and liver. Okay, very good. Um, Catherine, give me um, some specific details as if you're teaching some of these residents about um, what are some clinical uh, pearls about dealing with the things that um, uh, Tyler is mentioning. Yeah, so you mean like during surgery or? Any, yeah, I'm anything? leaving that very general for you. Yeah, like I, I know that um, a couple of times when we looked at, like you and I, when we've looked at patients with pseudo exfoliation, you can even kind of like um, definitely look how the lens is, they can have some phacoadenesis or, or rhododenesis just because of zonular weakness or dehiscence. And then when you actually like pound your fist on the slit lamp while they're at there, while they're there, you can actually see some movement of the lens or instability. Um, and then just being, I guess, um, and then just being really careful during surgery with what their um, le bag lens complex. So usually putting in like CTRs and things like that. Okay. Or what, about uh -huh. what, what about glaucoma associated? Anything specific about that that's unique about pseudo X? Um, it can be really unilateral, uh, like very, very strikingly as asymmetric. Um, and then also I think, uh, like SLT is a good option for these patients because the thought is that the pseudo exfoliative material is clogging up the drainage angle. Okay. Um, Marshall, any additional pearls when in regards to the glaucoma part of it? Oh, and um, Migs is also oh, an option. Sorry. Go ahead, Marshall. Sure. Um, oh yeah, uh, no, I think that's all good. I, I was just gonna say, um, like Catherine said, it can be like really asymmetrical and it can be quite dramatic. So you often have closer follow-up for these patients because even when they have normal pressure, they can kind of have a sudden spike, which can cause a lot of progression quickly. Um, they, I think also with note is that um, oftentimes the degree of pseudo exfoliative material, either on gonioscopy or on like other slit lamp exam is not necessarily associated with the, uh, the degree of glaucoma that they'll have. Um, and also um, related to SLT, SLT can shown, like, has shown to be potentially more effective than this and pigmentary glaucoma, but they can be potentially more pro-inflammatory. So I think at least here, they recommend just reading 180 degrees at most at a time. Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. So yes, so that hit most of the clinical pearls I actually wanted to talk about is when it comes to pseudoex glaucoma, um, SLT can be very highly effective. It, there's actually a ranking of how effective they are with the different types of glaucoma and pseudoex and PDS are at the top um, and, and Poag being in the middle. Um, so, but you have to be very careful uh, when you do so because, um, and, and typically we kind of set it at lower settings, especially with PDS, which is going to be my next, which is going to be another thing. But anyway, um, the other thing about pseudoex is that the reason why you want closer follow up is because these patients can be fine for a while and then all of a sudden come with a pressure of 40. And so, if a lot of these acute glaucoma patients that are coming in where their angles are open, um, look really closely because you may actually see pseudo X material on the lens or where else can you see it, Marshall? Um, like in the angle as a sample Lucy line. Okay, that or, or where else? Um, Mike? I for can't, can it build like, up on the zonules? Yeah, but it's, that's hard to see, Catherine. 
do you see it just at like the pupillary rough like the like basically the pupillary margin yes so um so just the heads up for everybody here pseudo x is highly prevalent here and you here in this these parts um you don't have as many pigmented patients to deal with but you see a lot of pseudo x uh, and, and there's a lot of patients that don't actually have pseudo X on the capsule, but if you look really closely at the pupillary margin, you'll see little, little bits of it. Um, and so um, these patients, patients can get really high pressure spikes. It can be unilateral, um, very high suspicion for that if you get an acute glaucoma. Um, they also tend to have downstream effects too. So it's not just at the angle. So if you do angle surgery on these patients, it may not be enough uh, because they, for whatever reason, have some downstream um, either in the collector channels or what have some effects. Uh, and that's a clinical pearl. Um, okay, let's talk about surgery for it real quick and then we'll move on. Um, so uh, I wanna go back to you, Catherine. So you, so you talked about zonular instability, okay? Um, so what part of the surgery um, do you have to look out for this um, starting from the beginning, which is the part that really is, I mean, all of them are important, but kind of like you're instructing a resident. Yeah, I think the biggest telltale sign of that zonular instability is for us when we make the capsule rexus at the Moran, we don't use a cystotome. We usually use the utrato forceps closed and then you kind of just use the tips to dip into the lens and then puncture the capsule. Um, and if it's moving around a lot or if you're not just like puncturing right away and it's almost like the lens is bouncing or you just like your tips don't go in right away, that can be the first clue of um, zonular and capsular bag complex instability. Okay. And um, say you have some uh, dehiscence. Um, so uh, tell us what types of things you can use um, uh, to help you um, when the bag's unstable? Yeah, so the biggest thing is if you have, uh, I believe like less than six clock hours of zonular dehiscence, um, uh, typically more like three, you'll, you can use a capsular tension ring, so or a CTR, mm -hmm. and you basically inject that into the bag, most typically after the entire lens is removed and you're like, and, um, and after you've removed all the cortex and you can put that into the bag. You can also use like Ahmed rings uh, segments, which are, um, like fixation structures that you actually have to uh, suture and fixate to the sclera. Um, and then there's also, um, those are the, oh, and also, sorry. And then also with other structures, you can also use capsular tension hooks, which kind of look like iris hooks, but they're a little bit more broad based and they have actually like two little curves. So you can also use that also if you're worried about that while you're actually doing the surgery. Okay, very good. Um, Mike, there is a certain number of clock hours that are, um, uh, that are the minimum, or I'm sorry, maximum. There's a certain number of clock hours that are appropriate for each device. Uh, can you run that down for us real quick? Yeah, CTR I think is three, and then Ahmed would be more like six. One thing I was going to add is when you're rotating the lens, if you know that there's a zonal instability, you usually won't, and you'll also do a lot more friendly maneuvers for nuclear disassembly, meaning you won't do like a direct chop where you could be pushing posteriorly at all. Okay, that's excellent. Um, so just to add to all those things. So um, capsular tension ring, typically you're looking at, yes, about two to three or less, okay? Um, if you're looking at four to six, you're look, talk, talking about a segment. And if you're looking at more than six block hours, you're talking about two segments, one on each side. Um, and uh, capsular tension segments can be held various different ways, but usually they are fastened to the sclera, okay? Either by sutures or we do a couple of different techniques. You don't have to mention that during the board session, but they will ask you how many clock hours uh, is appropriate for each device. Um, in terms of rotation, yes, you try to avoid rotation as much as possible. Um, the pre-chopper is actually very good at um, limiting uh, stress in those annuals, though, and we know that from the Miyake Apple View, uh, and and you'll see videos of that at different ask. If you guys are up at the parks, I don't know which one of you guys are. It's totally fine. I don't care. <laughs> but um, I may or may not be there. Okay, good. I think that's at, that's. I mean, it's better to be there than, than listening to this. Okay, good. Um, okay, we're spending a lot of time on this, but those are some clinical pearls. Um, Loxo one is a gene associated. Um, so okay, so Jordan, what is this? looking funny looking thing awesome. on the 
Awesome. Yeah. Sorry, super fast. Can I ask you a question? Do you okay. personally feel like it's worth it to save the bag with two Ahmed segments or just like bag it and go to Yamani since you're fixating two devices basically anyway? I have uh, changed my thoughts about that multiple times. And currently I would say that I do not have a um, straightforward answer for you. Uh, it kind of just depends on the situation. So um, what he's talking about is whether or not it's worthwhile to put all the hardware in there because the bag can still dislocate and then you got to take out all the hardware and just fasten with um, a scleral fixation technique like Yamani. And I have gone back and forth and I haven't decided yet. You tell me what they say at Park City. Okay. Um, That's fair, thank you. Yeah. Jordan, uh, sorry, going back to you if you're still on. No, I guess you're not, that's okay. Uh, Jordan left, yeah, Jordan I... had to go to the VA. Okay, Brandon, what is this funny looking thing on the cornea? It's a Kirkenberg spindle for PDS. Okay. Um, and what are some other things to look out for in PDS? Yeah, so you can have mid peripheral TIDs. You can have a sample lazy's line on Gonio. You can have Sheik or Zentmeyer's line. Um, those are the main things I would think about. Okay. What else would you be worried about? So, what would you be worried about besides this? Book? in terms of clinically? Like reduced pupillary block, high IOP. Um, I'm not okay, sure what, what you're looking for here. Yeah, no, well, there's one other thing that's really important. Lydia? Um, I think patients can have lattice degeneration and retinal detachments in like yeah. 20%. Exactly, very good, very good. So. This tends to happen in, so this is a boards thing because they're gonna ask you, what else do you have to worry about in high myopia um, retinal detachments? Um, so we already talked about SLT um, and how these patients, especially I've had one where they get really high IOP spikes if you go a little bit too high on the SLT. Uh, okay, let's see, Tony, what is this stuff on the cornea? Uh, I'm just looking at it. I'm thinking real quick. I know it's not the best picture, but uh, realize for boards, they will give you crappy pictures. You know, honestly, what? I'm not too sure what that is. Okay. Um, Allie, do you know what this is? Can you see it? Yeah, but I don't, I don't know. What it's trying to show me. Okay. Marshall, do you know? I think Marshall went to the OR. Okay. I think Catherine, it's yeah. me. Is this like, well, are they mid dilated or no? Okay, Catherine, since this is coming up for you, pretend that this is a <laughs> board's picture. Oh God. Okay. So you go systematically, right? Yeah. So this is a slam photograph of it looks like both eyes. Um, yes, it looks like both eyes. And my attention is drawn to the um the anterior chamber. It looks like there's some fibrinic substance in mm -hmm. both in both uh in both eyes. And it's difficult to tell from the photo, but it looks like that the pupil is mid dilated and there may be um, either a Bombay or some kind of anterior iris bowing of configuration of both irises, irises. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you, so this is in the cornea. Oh crap. Okay. Is that PPMD? Uh, no, PPMD doesn't look like this. So PPMD like has that. snail tracks, yes, but it doesn't look like this. Okay, anyone else have an idea? Are those, are they Hobstria? Uh, no, not Hobstria. Good guess. So that's not at all in the AC, it's all in the cornea? Yeah, this is all in the cornea. Does amaze. 
Uh, nope. So just describe it in terms of what it looks like right now. So sometimes this happens, just so you all know, sometimes this happens in boards. You don't know what the heck you're looking at, okay? And you may not even know what part of the eye it is. So you, you can, you saying fibrant and whatever, that's totally fine if you think that's what it is, but they, and they may just let you go off on track like that. But um, when it comes, <laughs> but, but they may kind of direct you back on track to, hey, this is in the cornea, which it is. One thing that I was wondering when, when I looked at it, but I think that makes me less suspicious for it is that it's bilateral. Um, my first thought was that it looks like a pseudohypropion and I was thinking of ghost cell glaucoma from a vitreous hemorrhage like weeks later, but I guess that would not be in the cornea. So I think that's just my question, if the pseudohypropion would look like this or in what way it would look different. Yeah, so that that would be in the anterior chamber. You're right, Lydia, that that's something that can happen and sometimes it can look like this, but this is in the cornea. So, okay, so this is a older patient and they're on certain medications and um, this developed all of a sudden. Oh, is this a oh. reticulata? Yeah, that's correct. Oh. So this is reticulata, okay. Um, but sometimes if you don't know what it is, just describe it and, and you're not sure at all, just describe exactly what it looks like. Hey, this looks like brownish deposits on the, if it's in the cornea, you know, it looks like brownish deposits that are in a whirl-like fashion, whatever. And sometimes when you're describing it, you all of a sudden figure out what it is. So yeah. uh, this is reticulata. This is actually a patient that I had. So um, what can cause this, uh, Tony? Sorry, I couldn't Sorry. hear your question. What can cause this if it's reticulata? So it can be caused by amiodarone, other medications, but also other things like um, uh, Give me two other disease, um, uh -huh. multiple uh, sulfatase deficiency, um, gangliosidosis. Those are the classic ones for boards that I know. Okay, very good. So um, amiodarone, Febreze are always the top ones. They, you can just call them corneal deposits. Um, but uh, there's also a medication that can cause this as well, um, topically, and uh, that would be Ropressa. And this was actually a Ropressa-induced patient that I have. Um, so um, are these visually significant, Abby? Abigail? These typically aren't noticed by patients. Okay. So that's the board's answers. Typically, they're not. Um, in truth, uh, I 100% feel that if it gets bad enough, um, it can actually decrease their vision. This patient had great vision, started on Ropressa, these developed, and all of a sudden she said my vision declined. Um, so uh, I stopped the Ropressa and we'll see if she gets better. But I have had a couple patients where I stopped it and it, the reticulata went away and it gets better. Um, so the answer is stop the offending agent. Uh, okay. Um, so Catherine, give me a differential of three things that can cause this. I know we're, we're, we're done. So this is the last one. Uh, yeah, you can have, um, you can have trauma. It, it could be like trauma during surgery or yeah any kind of traumatic iridialysis you could have a central iris atrophy like as part of an eye syndrome um and you can also have a uh, congenital like well congenital anodoridia doesn't quite look like this but you can have congenital iris anomalies okay good so um that's a good differential um axenfeld riger uh, any of the other, any of the developmental abnormalities. Um, and the main thing to know is that anytime you see an iris like this, you pretty much got to be worried about glaucoma because you have to be worried about the angle just not being sufficiently um, developed. Um, okay, I have a bunch more, but I know that we're at time. So um, anyway, um, sorry we didn't get to the cases earlier. I know the anatomy stuff is really boring and we probably shouldn't have spent as much time on that. Um, but uh, good job, everybody, and hopefully you all learned a few things um, in association with glaucoma, whether or not it's for OCAPs or oral boards. Thanks, Austin. Thank you. Could you send out? Thank you, Austin. Could you send out your slides to us? Yeah, sure. The slides are not the greatest, and they don't all have answers to them and stuff. Um, a lot of it was just to kind of drive the questions and discussions. 
Okay. Um, yeah. I think whatever you have, I think that it'd be helpful. And then we record, we recorded this if that's okay. So that we can at least recap for people who missed it. Sure. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks everyone. Good. Thanks. Austin. Very good.